as I understand, uh, it's primarily like the field started like from Ramsey or maybe yeah, like earlier, I, like j just to maybe even Robbie. Robbie, yeah. Just, yeah. I think really Robbie was the first one, I believe, uh, that proposed right after World War II. You know, you, you have you have a natural transition in those atoms. They should be serving as our timepiece, uh, you know, timekeeper, and. And it's just an amazing idea in some sense that he's just absolutely right, is ahead of his time, of course. But but that's how start, the whole field started, um, basically relying on the fact the natural resonance that's happening in, in a quantum system like atom or molecule. And you're trying to use this instead of artifacts that we make. Okay, here's a little pendulum and it's swinging under, and, under the, the gravity. And, but that depend, that's, the frequency depends on how long uh, you made the string and so on. It's, those are artifacts, right? You know, so the clock should be made out of natural phenomena. And if you have an atom, that atom, whether it's in any in your place on the on the surface of the Earth, if you have done your experiments right, they should all get, tell you the same frequency as long as you know your geo potential. Hmm. So that's the basic idea. And the Ramsey contribution came from he, he came up with this so-called separate field uh, oscillatory fields idea. Where essentially, like you and I want to check our time, we will compare our time now, and then we go out to have lunch, and we come back and we check our clocks mm -hmm. again, and we will say whose clock is moving faster and slower. Um, it, the Ramsey idea basically you know, allow you to use microwave to set the spin in motion, and you wait a certain time, you come back and see whether the phase or the frequency of the microwave free, microwave signal and the the atomic. Uh, evolution has walked off from each other, and you can use that information to make a correction to your microwave. And that's what I mean when I say microwave is now serviced to the atomic resonance. <laughs> what you are doing is basically comparing the free evolution of the atom against the free evolution of the microwave source, and make sure they are connected. I see. So why at that time it started from uh, like radio frequency range, like microwaves? Is it because the sources were much better than using, let's say, like same for optical transitions? Yeah, so from, from historical perspective, this is only natural. In World War II, that's where radar technology got it matured. And so microwave technology is just pervasively used in the, in the modern societies in the 50s, 60s. And so it's just very natural. You're looking at the microwave transitions in atoms. Laser wasn't even invented. Yeah, it's like later. <laughs> so, so the laser was invented in the, you know, in the early 60s. It's a kind of interesting. This is exactly the generation of my thesis advisor, Chen Hall. They were young at the time. And when laser was invented by people like Charlie Towns and so on. Lots of Prokhorov. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> from the Soviet Union. Soviet and, Union and, yeah. And Vasov and, uh, and so on. Yeah. And the, the, the idea of oh, maybe we can actually use these optical oscillations to just build as a clock, just like a microwave. Those ideas were early on unthinkable because the optical frequency is so much higher than microwave frequency. We're talking about a million times higher. There's just simply no electronics that would allow you to count the oscillation of the light. And, and so, so people don't think about uh, using optical clocks uh, at the early days of laser development. But I have to say, you know, Jan, people like Jan Ho and so on were involved in measuring speed of the light. There you can already see, in order to determine the speed of the light, you need to measure the wavelength and you need to measure the frequency. Because lambda times f equals to c, speed of light. So if you can somehow do very precision metrology to measure the wavelength of a particular laser, and you also can measure the frequency of that laser, then automatically you have a, the most precise measurement of the speed of light C. Mm -hmm. In the 1970s, this is still the frontiers of a science, like speed of light. What is that value? How can we define it? Or later on, in fact, speed light of light is now the constant of nature that's being defined as a particular value. And that triggered some of the early interest of developing so-called a frequency chain to be able to go from microwave step by step all the way up to the optical frequency. So you can measure optical frequencies through many intermediate mid-IR lasers and so on to build this gigantic chain to be able to measure those frequencies. And once that idea was realized, 
people start to start to dream. Okay, then it must be possible that we can use optical transition directly to make a clock. And but you can still see it's a non-trivial. You know, this chain is many many looms full, with operated by several PhDs. Uh, and but why optical would it be attractive? That's actually very simple. Uh, if you have an oscillation that's a million times faster, but lasts the same amount of coherence time, meaning suppose in one second is your coherence time, microwave os oscillates a giga or 10 gigahertz, meaning you have 10 billion oscillations per second. But optical, you can have a 1 million billion oscillations per second. And obviously, if you can keep track of all these oscillations, the one that's oscillating faster will allow you to accumulate less mistake. And so that's the key thing is optical transition offers a better quality factor. Or another way of saying, in a given interval of coherent evolution, you have accumulated more sinusoidal pendulum type of oscillations so that the fractionally speaking, the mistake you're making is much less than compared to the microwave. That's the key. But you can see just like a microwave oscillator, you have to make a laser to be really coherent. So now this we are talking about pushing laser frequency step stabilization to uh, to the state of the art and go much beyond compared to the 1990s and 2000s. The other is that the atoms now are going to be the, providing the reference, not in the microwave domain, but in the optical domain. And we all know about Doppler effects. So the, when the wavelength gets much shorter, the Doppler effect gets much bigger, fractionally mm -hmm. speaking. The Doppler effect is proportional to the so-called k vector, 2 pi over lambda times the velocity. When lambda gets really tiny, uh, any little motion provides a sufficient frequency shift that you have to account for. So suddenly, uh, in microwave, maybe the atom motion can be still be tolerable. In optical domain, any little motion, you know, a centimeter per second, Kind of a motion leads to a very significant frequency shift. So suddenly the laser cooling and the trapping and cold atoms becomes a centerpiece of research for being able to develop optical atomic clocks. And so you can see where all these small pieces are coming together, laser frequency stabilization, control of ultra cold atoms, engineer many body states, you want to put as many atoms as possible together so you can get a higher signal to noise ratio and they all have to work together. And then finally, now you have this one optical frequency, say, uh, serviced onto the optical transition atom. You still have to translate that frequency down to microwave. And, and these days, we don't, do not use this frequency chain that I described earlier, but we use an optical frequency comb. Uh, this frequency comb is a concept, actually, uh, a Russian scientist called Chabatayev came up with in the 1970s. At the same time, completely independently, a young professor, Ted Hensch, at Stanford University, came up with these ideas. And so these ideas were very early on, but it did not get realized until 20 years later when Ted Hensch's lab in Munich, Gahin, was really able to start to demonstrate the frequency intervals can be bridged by modal lock lasers. And then Jan Hall, um, you know, has been working on optical frequency his entire life. And he was considering retirement at the time, but then the optical frequency comb generation, this revolution really hit us. And Jens, of course, has all the tools in his uh, sle up his sleeves of how do you laser frequency stabilization? How do you broaden the spectrum of the model lock laser further so they can do in one step connecting pulse trains to actual frequency comb to stabilize it. And that idea, and I would say super happy for Jan Hall and the Ted Hensch Shield Nobel Prize uh, in 2005 for that development because it's a revolutionary. It suddenly allow us to have a single oscillator in the optical domain to be connected in the microwave with a very small device. You no, no longer need a loom full of lasers with 10 PhD operating it. It's one graduate student does it all. So, so the, the, this just opens up tremendous amount of um, um, the research possibilities. And this is the one area where oftentimes a fundamental research piece, like I want to build an optical atomic clock, I need to be able to count the optical frequency. Well, the frequency comb allow you to do that. 
right? But actually, frequency comb offers much more. Suddenly, now we are using frequency combs to do sensing because the comb can have essentially the, idea, the name of comb implies that you can have many zillions, millions of optical markers. They are all face locked together over a very broad optical spectrum. And these days, we are pushing into the, into the infrared, the extreme ultraviolet. And in the infrared, you can use the frequency combs to measure molecular resonances. And we are using this now to measure people's breath, uh, to understand if you get sick by uh, COVID or maybe have a lung disease and so on, your breath will change. And we will be able to use a frequency comb to measure the minute amount of changes of molecules coming out of your breath to tell you what to be watching for, uh, what are possible problems with physiological conditions of your health. And that's, this is kind of amazing, right? You know, this is a research tool had nothing to do with biology, biology you know, medical science. It was really meant to be serving a very specific goal of connecting optical frequency to the microwave, and yet it's just tremendous amount of uh, application. So was it the original idea of the comb? Was it like a gear cog between yeah. the optical frequencies and, and the exactly. microwave? So you can... It's like a reduction gear. It's like if you are, you have, you are, you are the, the you are the avid biker, you know, this is exactly the idea. Like you you are going up the mountain or going down the mountain, you want to go to the low gear and the high gear. And what you are doing is, of course, it's connecting the two front and back wheels with this reduction of the gear things. But it's really important this this gear connection. Every single tooth matters. You cannot have one of them just miss a few tooth. That system won't work. So so this optical frequency comb connects the two gear, the two rotating wheel. One is in the microwave, the other one is in optical. And of course, just imagine this wheels are, optical frequency is a million times higher. So it's like a, you are riding a bicycle in city of border. This bike is gigantic. The other, the other uh, one, one of your wheel is a, this small, tiny, regular one, but the other wheel is as big as the radius from Denver to border. Um, and, and you have to connect, somehow they have a chain to connect them up. And, and this connection has to be completely face coherent. In another way of saying, every single little click on the, on the gear is, is translated. Artists.